All right, we're looking at First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Everyone, let's look at verse 11, from verse 11 again. It says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. We're told here to know them. He beseeches us to know them which labor among you and are over you as well in, uh, in the Lord. And that admonish you and these people that are around us, our, bre our brethren in the Lord. We're told to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Look at those words there, very highly. Esteem is already a high level of respect and adoration and, and, and like towards these people, but to esteem and then to go further very highly, not just highly, but very highly. Look how much he's emphasizing this. This is three points of emphasis uh, in love for their work's sake and to be at peace among yourselves. Everyone, I'd like you to take an actual opportunity to just look at the people around you. All right, and let's just go around and everyone, I'd like you to all say your name and one thing that you like. Let's give a quick introduction and everyone do your best to hear their name and remember this thing about them. All right? We're going to start with, uh, with Brother Jason. Why don't we start and we'll go around like this in a heart shape. Uh, my name is Jason. Uh, I like... All right. What's his name? Jason. What does he like? Coffee. Do we esteem him very highly? Yes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we do now. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. All right. Let's keep going. <laughs> there we go. What's her name? What does she like? Good. Well, let's keep going. Oh, uh, great. Uh, my name's Cody, and my like. Oh, really quick, Jason. All right. <laughs> What's his name? Cody. What does he like? Good. Let's keep going. Jason. All right. What's her name? What does she like? Easy. All right, let's keep going. All right, what's his name? Emilio. <laughs> what does he like? Pizza. Pizza. Very good. All right, let's keep going around here. Uh, my name is Marius. Uh, and I like uh, spinning pump with my kids. All right. What's his name? All right. What does he like? Spinning pump with kids. All right. My name is Radu, and I like doing puzzles with my kids. All right. What's his name? Radu. And what does he like? Doing puzzles with kids. Okay, well, other side of the table. All right. What's her name? Carissa. What does she like? The beach. All right. Uh, my name is Kyle, and I like spending time with my family. Great. What's his name? Kyle. Uh, what does he like? Spending time with his family. Great. And over here? Oh, my name is Pasha, and uh, I like my family and uh, sugar. <laughs> the sugar more. Nice. What's his name? Pasha. What does he like? Yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. Right. All right. Good. Did I miss it? <laughs> Got around here. Daniel. Right. What's his name? Daniel. What does he like? All right. Cool. My name is Philip, and I like the new ice pizza. All right. What's his name? <laughs> Philip. No. What does he like? New ice pizza. Amen. My name is Kendall. Yes. <laughs> You're like, what? Triangle. 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 All right. Who's the mathematician in the house? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's his name? Uh, and what does he like? Triangles. Triangles. All right. Well, it's like equilateral or <laughs> acute, <laughs> acute, <laughs> acute. A forest. Oh, jungle. Oh, jungle. Oh, 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 jungles. Oh, 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 triangle. Oh, Sorry. Who heard triangle? Mathematician in the house. All right, he likes forests. Don't forget it. Oh, it's steaming and piling over there. All right. Okay, that's the correct answer. I mean, I haven't gone yet. <laughs> What's his name? What does he like? Why? Yeah, amen, brother. Me too. That's what I was going to say. And my name's Oliver, and yeah, I like my wife. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, my answer is I, yeah, no, I like you guys. The whole reason I came. Um, of course, you know, oh, soul winning, get the souls, and, and you know, all that. Yeah, yeah. 
but I could do some winning anyway. But really, I've got a heart for Melbourne. I've got a heart for you guys. I wanted everyone to be united today, and um, that's why I'm here. Um, I like I like the people here. I like the, the the children of God and my brothers in Christ, my sisters in Christ. And I, I wanted to spend more time with you today. That's why I wanted to do this today. This today is actually important to me. And uh, the lunch time we had yesterday that was important to me. Um, you know, working together and meeting you. Uh, we can we can truly go soul winning anywhere. There's an abundance of, of unsaved people, but this group only exists here. Amen. Amen. All right. So. Uh, Verse 13 again is to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And verse 12 says to know them. We've just met our names, but who are we really? Everyone look at verse 5. Verse 5. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 5. It says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So what's our identity according to this? We are the children of light. And that's how we're supposed to know each other. More important than just the things we like or our names and the, the cosmetic details of us. This is really what's important to us. This is our true identity. We're children of God. We're children of light. Right? And so there's many names for the saints in the Bible. The saved, the saints, the children of God, the believers, the faithful. Here we are, the children of light. And I just wanted to explore that a little bit over here. Because we're in a place called Melbourne. And Melbourne hasn't really been described as a spiritually very light place. It's a place of darkness. But it's in the darkness that the light really stands out. Amen. We are Melbourne's children of light. We are Melbourne's children of light. And that's the, the title of this message today. Everyone go to John chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 36. John chapter 12. Open it in your phone if you have it. Sorry, you're going to be burning your fingers, but we should search the scriptures, whether these things be so. Yeah, you can have them. I've got my scriptures here. If someone doesn't have a Bible, just share with the person next to you. John chapter 12, verse 36. The Bible reads, While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. So the, the lights multiplied and they brightened yesterday, amen? amen? They multiplied because many believed. And it says it here in verse 36, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. Once we believe, we become the children of light. And many people, 29 of them in fact, believed yesterday. That was an exceptional outcome. Amen. And not just the multiplications of light, but the brightness thereof. The brightening of the light happened yesterday because we as lights shone brighter and brighter as we grew more courageous and we gave the gospel with more skill as we grew closer in the Lord. We were shining brighter, coming together as small, individual, distant, scattered lights. We came all into one place like a great you know, congregation of candles lighting a bushfire. We just came all into one place and our light was shining in the darkness yesterday. And I believe we're shining here today as well in this congregation. We're, we're shining bright as the children of light. Turn to John chapter 1. You probably know this one. You've heard it a lot. John chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible reads, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The children of light shine in darkness, and we are made distinct by our shining from the world. And as Christians as well, there's many denominations, many saved and unsaved. But we, we shine in darkness, because that shine, that light comes from our heart. We'll look at that later. And we are made distinct by this. We shine in darkness. So where the darkness is, that's where we're made bright. That's where God is glorified the most. Turn to John chapter 8. We're going to be in John a lot. John chapter 8 says in verse 12. John 8, 12. John 8, verse 12. What does it mean to shine in darkness? What does that look like? Is this just a pretty metaphor? It has some content to it. We're going to look at that. In John 8, verse 12, it says... Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the light that's also described in John chapter 1. He's the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. But he lights us more specifically because we are shining the light of life and we're not walking in darkness if we follow him. That's what we did yesterday. We were following him. We were saving people's souls, as he did, as he came to do. And we were shining with specifically not just light, but the light of life. Turn to Matthew 5. This light is the salvation of other people's souls. They're in darkness, and they, don't, they have no way around. They cannot guide themselves. They need light to see where to go. People often speak of the light at the end of the tunnel when they're dying. It's fake, but we are that light in actuality. We are the light at the end of the tunnel. And there's a way that leads to that light, and we're, we're shining it. 
in verse uh, 14, from verse 14 in Matthew 5, it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Just a thought here. How few Christians ever in their lives ever shine, though. They are this light. They are the children of light. They are, they are lighted in their hearts by Jesus Christ. But what a small percentage of saved people that would ever even darken the doors of a church with their presence, let alone get plugged into the church and go soul winning. Do you realize how rare the people are that are sitting around you today? We may just seem like a ragtag congregation of the people that happen to be in Melbourne. But consider the history of everyone that's ever been saved. From the start of creation till now. The history of everyone that's ever existed. And we get what? A, 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 a remnant, the Bible says. A small, you know, the way is narrow that leads onto life, the Bible says. Few that be that find it. What a small fraction of people that actually become children of life. But then we go soul winning. And how many people among those that we get saved actually go to church? Yet again, you're cutting this number from short. And then you get this 1% number. And then we're getting 1% of 1% that would actually go to a church and regularly attend services and learn from their Bible. Then how many of those people sitting in those seats are actually zealous for doctrine? Probably another 1%. We're just shortening the number again. A percent of a percent of a percent. Then all those people who are learning doctrine, they go to, let's say, a, an IFB church, old IFB, whatever the case, right? How many of those people would actually ever once in their life go soul winning or share the gospel? It's a percent of a percent of a percent of a percent. It is such a rare thing in every generation of man. When we get to heaven, you understand that of all the people there, you're going to be the elite crew. The, the very few who have actually gone and shared the light with people. It's an exceptionally rare thing. The people around you, the names you heard today, the people we worked with yesterday, it's not a common thing. Remember and esteem very highly for thy work's sake. Isn't that what First Thessalonians said? To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake? This is why they're esteemed very highly and they're qualified so highly because these people, for their work's sake, they're not around. You guys are something really special. And gathering together like this, it's not common, and it's extremely special. Go home remembering that. This is not something that happens every day. This is really important. The Bible says that we who are saved, Jesus is, is the King of kings, which makes us kings and, and queens and princes and princesses, right? This is an exceptional group of royalty that are here today, and we need to stick together. We need to become this, this great shining light. It's, we have a chance to do something exceptional in history. To win 29 souls is exceptional in human history. It doesn't happen. And we can do it. We're that team. So stick together, right? Now it says here in, uh, in verse 16, you're still in Matthew 5, verse, uh, chapter 14. Let's look at verse 16. It says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. That's what we did yesterday, brethren. Turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're looking at what the light of life is. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 3, the Bible says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this light is shining in our hearts, and it's to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so this light that's shining, we don't actually see it. Like if I look around at you, brethren, you're not actually like Catholic paintings with glowing discs behind your head. We know that this is figurative and that the light is in our hearts, that there's a spiritual meaning to this, and that this light that we've been given is shining out in our hearts, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and we give this light onto others, and it passes on into their heart, it enters into their heart. Right? Now, this is figurative, but it will be literal. Everyone turn to Daniel chapter 12. This will literally become a light 
that you can see. What God speaks will be done. In Daniel 12, verse 3, in your Old Testament, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, that's the sun and the stars, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. For all of eternity, in heaven and the new earth and new creation, we're going to be shining brighter and brighter the more souls we win. What does that say in verse 3? And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. We turned 29 people to righteousness yesterday. All of you were part of that. Silent partner or not, you are praying, you are working, you are laboring. The Bible is clear that they that abide by the stuff, they that are at the vanguard, they that are at the rear, everyone gets paid the same. We're all in this together. Without all of you guys, none of this would have been accomplished. Right? 29 is all our number, and that's given to our account in the rewards. We're all going to shine forever and ever in heaven as the stars. You'll literally be able to see who's out there doing the work. Isn't that a thought? And like I said, even a percent wouldn't go to church, let alone learn the doctrines zealously, let alone go out soul winning. You'll be kings among kings. And keep this up, brethren. God is very pleased. And the more that we esteem each other very highly, the more we'll accomplish going forward. This is an exceptional start to something. So uh, my conclusion to this first point is that there is a darkness that we're shining in in Melbourne. And that brightness is what we all the better for it. The darkness that we're experiencing is that there's no soul winners. Not really, not enough. And then there's few brethren, but at least now there's 29 more. And we can change that. We can increase the light in this darkness and, and glory God, glory to God all the more. The second point I want to make is back in uh, John chapter 1, we read already verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness comprehended it not. This is the second part I want to focus on here. The lack of comprehension the darkness has for us, the light. They don't understand us. They don't see us. They don't get us. We're unique to them. They might think they're strange. Why would we even meet here in a, in a park gazebo and, and do this? We must be strange people. The darkness doesn't comprehend the light. But the children of light, we comprehend the light. The light doesn't only refer to the, the salvation of people's souls. The light is the light that illuminates truth. The light is, the, is, is wisdom. The light is discernment and judgment and truth. As children of light, what makes us distinct? The first point was that we shine in the darkness and we get people saved. We glorify God by our good works. But the second point of the light, shining in the darkness, is that we cut through lies and deceit and deception and false doctrine and the false philosophies of this world like a hot knife through butter. Our love for wisdom screams out in a world that's just apathetic and lovers of gullibility and lies and deceit. We are children of light because we love truth. And that's how we got saved, amen? Because we wanted the truth and we sought after it, like our lives depended on it. We we're hungry for it. That doesn't make us better people. We might have been sinners exceedingly. We might have been horrible people. Perhaps the 29 people we, we won to the Lord yesterday were better than us and are better than us. Even now, we're sinners exceedingly. But one thing we can say about ourselves, brethren, that in all that sin, in all that filth, we love the truth. Amen? Amen. We sought after the truth. And that little part of us, that little part that God loves, He rewarded it. Because Him that seeks, He will find. If we knock, it will be opened. Everyone turn to John chapter 3. I love this one. John chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 20. John chapter 3. Everyone knows John 3.16. Right? But then we get to 17 and 18 and 19 and 20. This is John chapter 3, verse 20. Look how it's going on after the, the most famous verse. In John chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Did we do evil, guys? Did we do evil? We do, don't we? We're all sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. That was us. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Jesus Christ was our savior, but he was also our judge. Imagine you're a criminal, and the only person who can save your life is a policeman. It's hard to walk towards that light. You want to. You know he might be your only hope. You also know you're a criminal, and you don't want to get arrested. There's this kind of push-pull going on. But our, our love for truth overcame. Look at the next verse. 21. But he that doeth truth...
cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Notice the, the comparison there in verse 20. Verse 20 says, for everyone that doeth evil. You would think that the opposite of doing evil in verse 21 would say, oh, but he that doeth good cometh to the light. But it doesn't say that, does it? It's not paralleling doing evil with doing good. It's paralleling doing evil with doing truth, speaking truth, speaking truth, learning truth, loving truth. This is the parallel that's given because no one can do good. There's none righteous, no, not one. We can't become good. We are all evil. We're all sinners, but we can do truth. And in that, we can cut through and get saved and get other people saved. Let's read that again. Verse 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Turn to Proverbs chapter 8. The children of light love, a children of light love wisdom. Turn to Proverbs 8. And wisdom, we love it because it's such a beautiful thing. The light of wisdom, the holiness of, of wisdom, the purity of wisdom, it's such a beautiful thing. So the, the five boys that uh, got saved at Chanston yesterday, that called upon the name of the Lord. Actually, I was, uh, when I was giving them the gospel, the thing that made them pay attention and kind of perk up was that they didn't want to be ignorant. Everyone, everyone can just like have their opinion of, of Christianity or religion, but they haven't actually read the Bible. They don't actually know what it says. They have an idea, ah, oh, you know, God and Jesus and light and church and all that stuff, and the goody goodies and stuff, but they don't actually know what it says. They've never read it. They've never even tried to understand it because they don't love truth. They don't care about what it says. Even though this book is the most famous thing that's ever appeared in human history for the last, you know, forever, you know, at least 2,000 years since it spread throughout the entire world. This book has influenced more nations, wars, politics than any other book in human history. You'd think they'd be like, oh, a mild passing interest. But no, they, they literally don't care about truth or finding out or knowing or figuring it out. They don't care at all. They wouldn't, they wouldn't pass their mind. They're too busy going to bars or, you know, fornicating or just having fun with their lives. And that's what it says in John, doesn't it? Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither comes to the light. But they that doeth truth... Even though that truth might, might destroy them for their sin, they, they have to know, right? <laughs> they, they just can't help it. We love that truth. We love that light. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 8 from verse 1. It says, Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? Wisdom is crying out, Hello, I'm here. Some people listen. Most people don't. Look at verse 17. It says, I love them that love me. This is wisdom speaking to us. I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. It's a promise from God. If you seek after wisdom, you shall find it. And early, quickly. It's not going to be this long journey. It's like, what's true? Here it is. Oh, wow, that was quick. <laughs> Isn't salvation so fast when you actually want it? Look at verse 35. Skip ahead. Verse 35, it says, for whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Another word for favor in the Bible is grace. Shall obtain grace of the Lord. Whoso findeth me, meaning finds wisdom, finds life. Isn't that true? Once you find the truth at that very moment, that's when you find life. Amen? Look at verse 36. This is beautiful. But he that sins against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Doesn't that just ring out? Everyone that hates the truth and doesn't seek the truth and doesn't come to the light, doesn't want the truth, doesn't want to know, they love death. And what's their end? Death. Is it because they're bad people? No, everyone's bad. It's because they didn't want the truth. They didn't seek after the light. But we are children of light and we seek after the light. That's how we got saved. And that's just where the light begins, brethren. Then we've got a whole Bible to learn and to do. And not just be hearers only, but doers of the word. That's how we truly walk in the light. Now let's, uh, let's turn to, uh, let's turn to uh, 2 Thessalonians. So I told these boys that being ignorant, being foolish is a sin. The thought of foolishness is sin. And their ears perked up. And I said, look, you're never going to get to heaven by being good or perfect. It's impossible. And they thought, yeah. It's like, well, how can we do it then? And I told them, you have, to, you have to seek after the truth. You have to find the truth. You can't be willfully ignorant. You can't be gullible. The Bible says that being gullible is wicked. And, you know, it's like, oh, really? Does the Bible talk about being gullible? It actually does. There's a verse that I really love in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Being gullible, having willful ignorance, is in fact wrong. We're commanded to be wise concerning all things. 
right? We're commanded to have good judgment and to be discerning, right? Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 10. It says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteous, unrighteousness. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. What does that mean? That's a, that's a mouthful. Everyone, let's say that. Deceivableness of unrighteousness. Ready, you go. What does being deceivable mean? Trickable. You're trickable. You're deceivable. Right? This isn't talking about someone doing the deceiving. That's the deceiver. This is just talking about the deceivable. You're trickable. And what's it saying here? It's the deceivableness or trickableness of unrighteousness. This is the wickedness or the darkness of being gullible and just going with the flow. And just believing what your family told you, or your society told you, or your generation told you. And just not trying to figure it out, not caring. This is deceivableness of unrighteousness. Let's keep going from verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see the pattern here? It's exactly the same as John 3. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. They were doing wickedness. They were behaving in their works sinfully. And the opposite of that, loving truth. These people, they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They cared not about the light. But we, brethren, are different. We're children of the light. Like, we love the truth. That's how we got saved. But how rare, even after getting saved, do you continue to go into church and love the truth even more? And then to love it so much that you're willing to share it. Such a rare thing. You're shining brightly, brethren. Let's look over here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We are children of light because we love the truth and we seek after wisdom. And you, brethren, are even here today in this cold, hearing to preaching. What a strange people you are. <laughs> Who would endure this pain just to learn something cool from the Bible, even if it's one thing? Ephesians chapter 2. We know this very well. Before I get to it, I'm just going to talk about the Melbourne darkness we're facing. In my first point, I talked about the Melbourne darkness of no people saved and no soul winners. But now I'm going to talk about the darkness and the dearth of wisdom and truth, that form of light in Melbourne. It's a place of the, the great deceivableness of unrighteousness. What a gullible people you have in Melbourne. They just go with the flow and believe whatever society told them. They never actually try to figure out what's the point of all this. They never actually dig or fight for something that's worth believing. What are some of the deceptions as well that are going around? Why do we need more churches here? Why do we need a light church, a church of light, a church of the children of light here that's shining brightly in this darkness? Because there's great deceivableness and there's great deceivers and deception. There's both sides going on in this state of Melbourne. The first deception would be the repentance of sin doctrine, that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Who here met people out there to, uh, in Oakley that believed that? I did. It's everywhere, this false doctrine, and it's leading people into darkness. It's, it's, they're deceivable, and they've been deceived. These are the, uh, the repent of sins to be saved crowd, or as I like to think of them, the sons of perdition. Because, uh, in case you don't know, son of perdition, that's the name for Judas Iscariot in the Bible. Judas Iscariot famously repented of selling out Jesus and hanged himself, you know, before, he, <laughs> before, before his death, obviously, hanging himself. But... He's known as the son of perdition. But guess what? The son of perdition repented of his sins. And he's burning in hell. <laughs> so these repent of sins crowd, we can call them the sons of perdition. Then you've got the, the, the hyper-dispensationalist, the dispensationalist crowd that believe there's multiple gospels. How many Baptist churches in Melbourne believe in multiple gospels for every dispensation or age for mankind? I mean, aren't they just everywhere? This deception is rampant. They're all bringing multiple gospels around, these dispensationalists. I call them the accursed, <laughs> because we're supposed to let them be accursed if any man bring any other gospel than that which you have heard from us. So these are the accursed. We have the sons of perdition in Melbourne. We have the accursed in Melbourne. And the last one we have in Melbourne, the great deceptions that are coming around from fake Baptists are the excluded. We have the sons of perdition, the accursed, and the excluded. Who are the excluded? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. These are the excluded people. These are the fruit boasters who boast of their fruit. Look at me. I know I'm saved because look at all my works. 
Look at my many wonderful works. Look at all my great fruit that I bring forth. The Holy Spirit's in me and I know it because look at my beautiful behavior. These people never go soul winning. But they love to talk about how holy they are and how good they are and, and rank themselves. Oh, I don't think this person saves. I haven't seen the fruit. He doesn't act like a saved person. He acts like a worldly person. Look at them judging people and condemning them. Calling them liars when they've called upon the name of the Lord. Right? Why? Because they're comparing them to themselves. You know, they're judging them. Oh, they still do this. They still drink. Ah, oh, they didn't even come to church last week. Are they even saved? These people are going to split hell wide open with that attitude. And they are excluded. They're the people that are going to bring up their many wonderful works as evidence for their salvation at the gates. And they're going to be excluded. So these are the, 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 these are the three deceptions that seem to be purveying in Melbourne. The sons of perdition, the, you know, the repent of sins crowd, the accursed, you know, bringing many gospels for different ages, and the excluded, the people boasting of their fruits as evidence of their salvation. These people, they're creating a darkness in Melbourne. They put the, the, the sign up of a Baptist church or whatever other church. They pretend to be children of light, but they're children of darkness. They're spreading darkness in this state. And we have to fight them. This is why a church needs to be here, or many churches rather, need to be in Melbourne that are preaching against these wicked, damnable heresies and shining light in a dark Melbourne. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? So this boasting. Sorry, fruit boasters. There's no boasting in this. You can't look at your works as evidence of salvation. Romans 4. You don't have to turn there. Verses 3 and 5 say, For what saith the scripture? Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So to these accursed people who are bringing a different gospel for Abraham, sorry, Abraham was saved by believing in God, amen? And it was counted unto him for righteousness. He didn't have to work his way to righteousness. God just said, you're righteous now because you believed in your heart. It says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So there's two types of faith. There's the faith that worketh, and there's the faith that worketh not. Two types of faith. Which one is the saving faith? To him that worketh not. His faith. His faith. The working not faith is counted for righteousness. So when people bring up James 2 here, Oh, faith without works is dead. That's the working faith. They're trusting in the wrong faith. They have the wrong faith. The James 2 faith is not salvation faith. The Romans 4 faith is salvation faith. And we need to shine that light in a place of darkness. And what darkness is that? All these Melbourneian preachers saying James 2 faith is salvation faith. But that is darkness. The light is that the Romans 4 faith is salvation faith. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And this light needs to be shined brighter and brighter because the darkness, it just seems like it's winning sometimes. Brother Jason was saying he knocked on doors and saw so many saved people, but they're just going to random nonsense churches preaching false gospels. It's a, it's a dark day. But let's start something, brethren. This is, I feel like, the start of something really good. And let's build it up from here. Let's make the next one even bigger, even better. Bring people. Tell your friends. Get them, get them involved. If you go to churches, spread the news, bring them in. Even if they're silent partners, encourage them. Just say, just watch. Just watch, and you'll shine like lights. Tell them the things I told you. You'll shine like the brightness of the firmament forever and ever. If you just come as a silent partner, the silent people that are praying, you're rewarded the same as the people at the vanguard, the Bible teaches. Just bring people out, and let's make this light huge. Amen? Amen. The final one is Romans 3. There's, uh, where is boasting then? It, it is excluded in verse 27. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. We know here that these people are excluded. I said that before. And let's just turn to, to back, uh, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And I'll finish here. We started at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's finish there too. Everyone go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And here is the conclusion of the matter. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, 
even as also you do. Everyone just look around one more time. Get a good look at the faces of the people around you. Verse 11 says, comfort yourselves together. That doesn't mean just pat each other's back when you're sad. I'm having a bad day, man. Ah, oh, there, there. That's not the fulfillment of that command. The comfort, it actually has a bit of an older meaning than that. The fort in comfort means to fortify. It means to fortify. And to comfort means to fortify together. We're coming together and fortifying. <laughs> so this comfort yourselves together is to strengthen each other. Yes, it means the pat on the head when you're suffering, but it just means link up, be strong together, team up, keep in contact with each other, send each other messages, know that we're all together, become strong as a unified force, comfort yourselves together, and edify, same meaning, said in another way. Edify means to build up, to strengthen, to teach. Edify, same root word as educate as well, to teach and to build in doctrine. Edify one another, even also as you do. Verse 12, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And this is the, the one I want to end it on. And be at peace among yourselves. The children of light are commanded to build together, grow together, comfort together, edify one another, group up, team up, stay together, stick together, don't split up. And when you're together, be at peace among yourselves. No fighting allowed, brethren. Thus saith the Lord. If you've got dramas, fix them. If you've got issues with people that might even slightly, possibly, maybe, I think, I hope, I want them to be, but I don't know, be a child of light, talk to them. Doesn't matter if you have doubts. If, if, if there's some deceiver or a bad person, they'll reveal it. Out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth will speak, they'll vomit up the puke of dece deception and darkness, and they'll reveal themselves. You don't have to lift a finger, you don't have to fight them, you don't have to be suspicious among yourselves. If there's any dramas or, or issues between you, fix them. It's a command here. Be at peace among yourselves. Don't let these things linger. Don't extinguish the light. Strengthen yourselves. Comfort yourselves together, brethren. It's an important work we're doing here. Let's build us all up. Amen?